Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruben. And may I thank you personally for putting this on. Uh, thanks for your leadership at a time of crises, not just in Armenia, but also globally. But also to send my warm wishes to many Armenians who are listening to this. These are difficult times. Uh, fear is not an issue that you can manage easily. Uh, and I, th I think this will empower many people watching. What could they do personally in terms of dealing with this, with this crisis? I think David uh, Nabarro, who very, very eloquently described the whole background globally. Uh, and may I just say, whatever he described is exactly the same happening at every country level. This virus doesn't know any boundaries, doesn't know anything about race or religion, doesn't even know if you're a prime minister or not, as you probably have heard in the last 24 hours, the combination of our prime minister, but also the minister of health have gone into self-isolation. So uh, I think I'm not going to say more what David said and also what His Excellency, the health minister in Armenia said. I think the only way in which we're going to manage this or at least try to get on top of it is through the public health interventions that have already been rehearsed. Uh, the only thing I could say, the virus is still in the driving seat. Uh, the, drive, the virus is still well ahead of all of us in whatever we're trying to do. So I'm going to talk more from a hospital perspective, healthcare perspective, rather than the health or the transmission rates. There is no healthcare system in the world, even in the best systems, whichever way you look, look at, that has the capacity to deal with what David described, the 15 or 20% of the population who are gonna get a severe disease. The only thing we can do to reduce this burden in terms of mortality is to get the balance right between the demand and the supply. As I said, the supply is fairly limited. In other words, the supply of health services. So I hope everyone listened to David in terms of what needs to be done out there. And what we are praying in the hospitals is how do we reduce this peak and extend, if you like, the curve so the demand, uh, we can at least manage the demand by having enough supply in terms of hospital beds. I think every overshooting the supply of beds and hospitals, and that is probably the the determinant of the mortality. And we've seen that in Italy, we've seen that in Spain, and I fear we're going to see this in the US as well. So uh, shielding patients at the biggest risk is something else we've done in the UK, and that's one of our successful interventions. Having a single system, the Ministry of Health looked at the whole population of 63 and 63 million and identified 1.5 million patients who have to go into isolation for a period of 12 weeks. The majority of these patients have a what we call a comorbidity, people like who've had a transplant before, people who've had certain cancer. They've gone into complete social isolation for a period of 12 weeks. To support them, we have managed to get volunteers. We put a call out for volunteers. Believe it or not, within 48 hours, there were 600 or 700,000 volunteers who are happy to go to these people's houses, supply them with food and all the support they may, they may need. The second thing in terms of dealing with the supply issue is to increase the capacity of the beds. So I am a cancer surgeon. I am currently unemployed because all the elective work in a hospital has been canceled. All the capacity that we have in a hospital setting is being dedicated for this work. And may I just add to that, it also includes the private hospitals. So the government through its security, health security bill that went through parliament recently uh, has done a, a, a contractual obligation with the private sector to release all the intensive care capacity but at the same time, freeing all the private sector capacity to deal with this, with this uh, pandemic. 
We also had to significantly increase our ventilation capacity because uh, out of the 15 to 20%, we expect there will be about a 10% to 15% requiring ventilation. That means we need more ventilators. We need to expand our critical bed capacity. Uh, ventilators are in shortage globally, but we've managed to find other creative ways of doing it. You probably have heard President Trump overnight instructed GM Motors to produce ventilators. In the United Kingdom, Dyson is about to start production of ventilators uh, to, meet the, to meet this huge surge in demand. Ven ventilators is one thing. You also need people who run these ventilators. So being unemployed, yesterday I did a, a whole day course in critical care management. So I'm going to be, if you like, working under the supervision of anesthetist in critical care facilities to run ventilators. So a lot of volunteers are coming in who are doing other activities in the past, which are no longer required, like dermatology clinics, cardiologists, they were all coming in uh, to get our, if you like, upskilling or reskilling in, uh, in managing this burden. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of work on research, vaccines. I'll leave that to Nubar to talk about. Uh, we're also increasing the capacity of our bed base. You may have heard that Excel Center, which is a huge center, mostly for entertainment, concerts, has been converted to a hospital with 4,000 beds. Uh, we put a call out for volunteers. These are NHS retired clinicians and nurses to come back, retrain, and they will be uh, running the uh, Excel facility. And there's a similar one in the Midlands uh, in which a, a non-healthcare uh, uh, infrastructure is being converted to an emergency, uh, emergency hospital. On the volunteering side, we've done very well. As I said earlier, volunteering to help these uh, 1.5 million uh, citizens who are at risk, but also many, many volunteers in the health sector. I'm going to move on to another issue on staff uh, uh, in terms of their safety. We did have a difficulty at the beginning in screening staff uh, in terms of access to PCR. That's taken about two weeks to correct. This weekend, we will start having a ring fence capacity to screen our staff because uh, the problem we had with staff, that includes me, by the way, about two weeks ago, where a member of my family caught the virus. So I had to go in isolation with the family for two weeks. That is not sustainable as we move into this phase, which starts probably at the end of this week or this coming week. Uh, of the surge. So staff will be tested there and then uh, with the results, and that's PCR testing. Uh, we have been testing some of the rapid PCR technologies. We believe there are a couple now that might be useful in that. Uh, in terms of also bringing in uh, antibody testing, because a lot of our staff who have been infected, we need to call them back. These are the people who could make a significant contribution. There's been a lot of concern in the UK on the per personal protection equipment. Uh, the first is on the guidance. Where do you use this? Uh, where do you need to use this? And we now have an independent uh, policy, which is published yesterday, bringing clarity who needs what level of PPE in terms of their protection uh, in different levels of critical care versus uh, even the use of uh, PPE in social care in the community. Uh, so that's been another move. We've been a bit slow on that, but things have, have moved on. I think the other controversy you referred to earlier is this whole concept of modeling and what's happening in the community and this whole concept of so-called herd community, uh, which was a bit of a surprise. Uh, I think it was a slip of the tongue at the at one of the press conferences, but let me come back to modeling. Maybe David could say a few words about this. I'm a scientist. I do be, believe in data. I do believe in analytics and I do believe in models. 
However, models are as good as what you feed a model with. In other words, if you have adequate population numbers that you've screened and you trust your data, your model is not never going to be uh, working. It will also, the danger with models could give you the false sense of security, what's happening out in the community. So David was very eloquent and very diplomatic in the way he explained this. If you don't know what is the prevalence of this infection, if you don't know what the reproduction rate of this virus is, you cannot believe the models. You believe what you know. And what we know historically in any pandemic, you come down top down and you intervene. And the only way in which you're going to reduce the reproduction model is by isolation. In other words, by social interventions. And we've seen some of the interventions, and now we are in the more critical bit of that social intervention, which is the lockdown. And in a lockdown, you're trying to achieve is to reduce this reproduction rate from uh, what it is at the moment, 2.4 to 3, down to 1. Then you will have control, and you can at least manage the supply of hospital services to meet this demand. And sadly, what we're looking in the United States at the moment, there is absolutely no control on the reproduction rate. So in the beginning, we, we had this, again, academic or intellectual thing. If we allow the reproduction rate to drop, but not to one, to get the 80% of the population who may have a mild illness, we may provide this herd immunity. But life doesn't work that way. And we, so I don't want to confuse it further. Uh, we are where we are. On the other hand, though, I think I'd like to make one or, uh, one or two other points about lockdown. Lockdown doesn't work for a long time. At best, you probably could push it to about three weeks, maybe four weeks. You will see a lot of social disturbance if you continue that beyond those three to four weeks. And let's not forget the economic impact on this. And I know... Uh, uh, I know later on we will be talking about it, at least touching on the economic impact, but let's not forget the economic impact on health. At economic downturns, the mortality rate also increases. So there's a balancing act here. So lockdowns do work. I'm a great supporter of it, but we need to get on top of it within the next three weeks. Uh, we envisage our peak to be somewhere at the end of next week uh, or early the week after. And, uh, and we could be as ready as we are uh, and hoping that we could manage this in the most intelligent and evidence-based way possible. Thank you.